So this will be the last lesson until what, April 22nd? We'll take a possible break. And then when we come back, I haven't decided yet what we'll talk about. But um, what I'd like to do today is um, as we wrap up the um, lesson on well, that, we've been in, that we have entitled Into the Heart of Eden, I'd like to uh, set before us uh, the, uh, the structure, the Lenten structure of light. Um, I talk about it in terms of this, the heart of Eden. So, uh, let me begin. <clears throat> so again, what is Eden? What is Eden? Where is Eden? You tell me. It's in our heart. Yeah. Now, um, this is a real good uh, a, a verse, I think, that, that helps us to understand the mystery of Eden. Eden comes from the fair Logos. Comes from the fair Logos. So who comes through the fair Logos? Christ. Christ. Um, the Christ or, or God in the flesh. Alright, so that um, uh, the mystery of Christ who comes to us and God becomes one of us through the virgin fair Logos is not just God, but it's God in the flesh, which means that it is um, God with us. God with us. Now today, in the, with the Feast of the Annunciation, um, when you go to venerate the icon of the Annunciation there in the middle, see if you can find the distaff in uh, the Theotokos hand, you know, the spindle. You'll notice that there's a, I think it's in her right hand, she's holding a, a distaff. It's round and round with thread. Uh, that, symbol, that's, that symbolizes uh, the thread of life. And so obviously it's the thread of human life. Uh, this is a very ancient symbol, not restricted at all to, to the Bible. It, it, you find it uh, in antiquity everywhere. It's a very, it's, it, you can, might even say somewhat archetypal you know, in, in Hume's terms. Something of an archetypal symbol. Um, and. Uh, it's, it's the iconographer's way of expressing or proclaiming the mystery that in the womb of the Theotokos, it's as though the Theotokos was weaving um, the garment of our flesh and blood for her son, for God. Um, so that in the womb, God takes upon himself, he clothes himself, with a garment of our humanity that is woven for him by the seamstress, the chief seamstress, if that's, or the spinner, whatever the, the, the spinner is called, uh, the, of the Theotokos. Um, now, associated with that image is another image of the baptismal font that comes to us from the Syriac tradition, which is that when Christ is baptized in the Jordan, um, he lays in the bottom of the Jordan, his robe of glory, or his robe of light. This is the robe, if you will, with, of, uh, of his glory that he is, with which he is clothed uh, from the beginning, that he had with the Father from the beginning. So he lays that robe down at the bottom of the Jordan so that um, when we are baptized, this God, who has clothed himself in our flesh, which means also that he has clothed himself in our death, he leaves his robe for us to put on, his robe of glory. So that the, um, so you have this imagery of the garment and of the, and of the spindle, or the, you know, the, the thread, to uh, express this, this profound mystery of of God having woven himself into the fabric of our life and, and, and so that our life and our death when we put on Christ is woven into the fabric of God's life and death in the flesh. So that means then that what? That to put on Christ is to put on his death 
But if we put on his death, we're also putting on his resurrection. So this is, this is a, a, a broadening, you know, of the, of the symbol of Eden. When we say that, so when we say that, that Eden comes through the Theotokos, we're talking about the mystery of Christ becoming one of us <coughs> and giving to, what, weaving, uh, giving to us the garment of his own death and resurrection. So that Eden isn't just, it's not just, um, it's not just Christ. But, you know, we need to understand that it's, it's, it's the whole mystery of God with us, of communion, intimacy. All right. So, if this mystery of God with us is in the heart, as I believe one of you said, um, ask the simple question, is it visible or invisible? What's that? Yes, it's invisible. It's invisible, even immaterial. So that takes us to um, this, I'm going to bring back this imagery from this very ancient text in the Syriac Christian tradition. I think it's dated from 300 or so, 400, something like that. And again, it's called the Liber. In Latin, it's not a Syriac name, it's a Latin name, which we like to say, you know, it make, makes us look learned. The Liber Graduum. Well, what's Liber, do you know? In Latin? Library. Book. Yep, that's where we get the word library or, you know, an airy, an airy, whatever airy is, must be a storehouse of books. Okay, graduate, you can kind of tell what that is. Degrees, graduations, that would be So, or steps, I think is how it's normally translated into English. Uh, the book of steps. Now, in this book of steps, Liber Gladium, the author, unknown, sets out the mystery of the church in three dimensions. There is the visible church, which opens onto the church of the heart, which opens onto the heavenly kingdom. Or the Church of Heaven. I think what needs to be noted is that these three dimensions are not, um, you know, they're not cut off from one another, um, as though they're not three parallel tracks that are separated from one another, or that are even reflecting, they're not even reflecting each other. As though I'm here, as though the visible church is here, the church of the heart is over there, and uh, they're just going along on parallel tracks. Um, maybe there's a mirror over there, you might, if you want to say there's a mirror over there, um, still, even if there's a mirror over there, the church of the heart is there, and I'm here, you understand. So what I want to point out is that there's no these are not parallel tracks, rather it's more like they're permeable, permeable dimensions, and they open onto one another, so that when you're engaging the, vis the visible church, you're also engaging these other two dimensions at the same time. Okay. <clears throat> now, what you say you can't have one without the others? You exactly. There you go. Right. Right. Um, now. What catches me, or even calls to me, is this, I find this imagery absolutely wonderful, and it just catches me. It arrests me. And I can't stop thinking about it. Um, it's interesting to reflect, or you know, to reflect, or let's say it's interesting to, to listen that's really what that's really what you're doing in the church is you're trying to understand and and, 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 and deepen your your engagement of the church the primary sense is hearing so you're listening you're, you're listening to everything as best you can and uh, what impresses me about the Holy Fathers is how finely tuned their ears are 
so they can they can read a simple uh, verse and in the most um, uh, mundane banal uh, you know ordinary word there they will hear so many things and uh, you you read it you miss it completely until you read the holy father and he points it out to you and now you say oh yeah it's right there all the time but i didn't see it so as I, I, as I reflect, as I listen to this, I, can't, I cannot but be struck by the correspondence between this threefold um, description of the church and, again, the threefold description of Eden, where you have the lower mountain, the middle part, <coughs> and at the top of the middle part you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and at the top, at the top you have the altar. And this corresponds, does it not, to the church? I did not make it parallel. You have the steps opening onto the narthex, opening onto the nave, opening onto the altar. One, two, three. And you generally will have steps. You know, steps into the narthex. You don't have steps going into the nave, but you'll have steps going up in, onto the ambon and up into the altar. Um, so again, you have this threefold mystery of the of the uh, of the church, which corresponds you know, even to the to the human being. You have body, you have soul, and then you have spirit or heart or noose. Also have image. All of these are words for this, the, the, the inmost part of us. Um, even house in scripture. So sometimes when you read house, you want to be alive to the possibility that it's talking about the heart, or the inmost self, uh, temple, so forth and so on. You get the idea. So that the, so that the, even a the human being is divided into three dimensions. Now. So I have all of these threes. I have all of these threes. And then they come to Great Lent. And uh, I am caught by what I think I can but I think I can see is a three-fold uh, structure of Great Lent. I just ran out of paper. Um, let's see if we can find them. Um, Great Lent. So let, let's ask it this way. In, as I pointed out in the lectionary of Great Lent, or let's say even the lectionary of the Triodian, they ask them, so when does the Triodian start? When does the Lenten Triodian start? What Sunday? What's that Sunday called? Publican and Pharisee. How many Sundays before we get actually to Great Lent? Is it, you have Publican and Pharisee, then you have what, the prodigal? And then you have... Last, the last judgment, and you have expulsion. So you have four Sundays or so. Um, but the point, I think, is that you do not, you open the Lent and Triodian, and you don't just bang, you're in Lent. It's like there's a narthex of time. These four weeks are like the narthex. You're in the entrance of Great Lent. And what are we reading in the scriptures during those weeks? So that when we enter Great Lent, where are we in terms of the lectionary? I pointed this out before. See if you can remember. Where are we? Exactly. So we start, Great Lent, at the tomb of Christ. Where does Lent end? might be a trick question. Think carefully. When is Lent ending? Exactly. So where are we at the end of Lent? We're at the tomb of Lazarus. And it's as though Great Lent is the nave. So you have these, pre these, these weeks that precede Lent as though they're the narthex. You come into the nave of Great Lent, the six weeks, the actual six weeks of Great Lent, which begin with the tomb of Christ and ends with the tomb of Lazarus. Where do we go from there? Obviously, we go into Holy Week. Where, 
is Holy Weekend? The Tomb of Cross. So, what do you think of that? Isn't that kind of cool? Might this structure of Lent correspond to all of these other things? Where, so if it does, I mean, I've already pointed out how it would correspond to the church. Narthex, name, altar. So like Holy Week, we're coming into the altar, coming into the sanctuary. But um, what if all of these threes are the same thing, or the same mystery? So what if we were to lay this threefold dimension of the church as given in the Liber Graduum? over this, what would we have? What would we have? Where would you put, well, you've got the visible, and you've got the kingdom of the heart, the church of the heart, and then have the church of the heavenly kingdom. So, um, which way would you lay this over? This way or that way? On the church, which way would you lay it? What would, okay, what would this correspond to? The visible. And this, this, so then that means that this would be the kingdom of the heart, and this would be, or the church of the heart, this would be the church of the heavenly kingdom. Where would you, how would you lay it here? What would this be? The tomb of, of, of the Lord. Just go with it. What would it be? Yes, this would be the visible church, which means that this would be the church of the heart, would correspond to the church of the heart, and this would be the sanctuary or the church of the kingdom. Now, does that make sense? I'll just stop right there and see what you want to make of that. Well, I mean, I see the, the setup, but I just don't see the connection, I guess, yeah. Connection between like you're saying, so that corresponds to that. Well, yeah, there's three, but all right. What is like the tomb of Jesus Christ? Why? Is it, yeah. Why is it visible? It's visible, and it's also the kingdom. It's some yes. Like tomb. Okay. Just all right. At different times. Yes. Those are the questions that you should be asking. Those are the questions that you need to answer. <laughs> you're standing up, but you answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, in the first, the first, the visible church. So at the beginning of like Christ is in the tomb. Is yes, but and and and, 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 uh, and let's say in terms of his existential condition, for lack of a better word, right. how is he in the tomb? I mean, in what he's state? Dead. What's that? He's dead. He's dead, which means that he's in his in the fleshly, the incarnate uh, fleshly uh, dimension of his, of, of his of, 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 so of our being, mm -hmm. um, and it says. It says in the in the in the in the scripture that the women uh, saw the tomb and how he was laid. Okay. Yeah, so all of this is it, it, it's it's visible in turn in the fact that it is in history, so it's in space and time, and it's and it's localized very specifically to this particular place at this particular time. So in that sense, it's visible. And Christ has very specific bodily dimensions. He's here, he's not there. <clears throat> All right, so that's how it's visible. Okay? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, it says in that scripture, and it's, it's Luke, it's Luke, chapter 23, verse, well, okay. Um, well, I'd love to, and then and the day was the day of preparation and the Sabbath. Epiphoskim, I love the, I, I love this image, it just calls to me, it just catches me. And the Sabbath is already beginning to dawn. Um, that, I think, is the Sabbath rest of God. It's the Sabbath rest, it's the beginning. This is the beginning in which everything is, re, is created. Um, it's, the, it's the Sabbath rest of Genesis chapter 2. The light is already beginning to come. What light? The light of the resurrection, the light of life, the light of Christ. But anyhow, it goes on. 
and that the women who had followed, um, who were with him, who had, who had followed with him from, from Galilee, they saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And, and it's interesting. I don't know, I mean, how much weight can you give this? When it says they returned, that is an infinitive. That's an infinitive verb. Now, what's the characteristic of an infinitive verb? Why is it called an infinitive? Yes, it, it's not. It's not. It's not finite. It, it's. It, it's. It's not. It's not um, um, bound to specific time, like past, present, or future. It's infinite. As though, I mean, it, again, I don't know how much weight to place on this, but I mean, it catches me, it calls to me. They return, or to return, it's, it's as though, it, you know, it's as though already, already, we're entering into the church of the heart, which in our body, of course, is localized in space-time, but in our heart, we, there's, there's something about our heart that is, well, as it says in Jeremiah, that is deep beyond all things, which means beyond space and time. So here they are in this particular space and time, watching Jesus, seeing Jesus' body, and they return. They go into that, it's as though they go, they go into this dimension within themselves, their heart, where they are not bound by space and time. And so that means that, that when they go into their heart, and when we go into our heart, we should be seeking each other, you know, right with me. There, there's the murmuring women right there. I mean, you like all of you. And then it goes on to say, and they um, prepared aromas and, and myrrh, or spices and myrrh. And the Holy Fathers take this that I've read, and say, like St. Macarius of Egypt, for example, or St. Isaac of Syria, St. Maximus the Confessor. They would see the spices and the myrrh to refer to, uh, they prepared virtues virtues. Uh, in other words, you know, they're, they're going, they're, they're returning, they're going inward. They're facing themselves. Um, they're facing themselves and they're, they're purifying their senses. They are working to purify themselves and, 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 in, and, in, and in so doing to, to cultivate uh, virtues within themselves so that they can see Christ. As we say, apostle, let us purify our senses that we may see Christ. Then it goes on to say, and, and you've heard me talk on this too, this is another thing that catches me. And they rested on the Sabbath, or they, Ezekusam, <coughs> from the verb, from the word Ezekiel, which is, a, as you know, is a very technical word for prayer. And I take that to mean, in a, in a spiritual sense, I see that saying, they entered into this hesychastic prayer, the prayer of stillness. It's called, it's also the prayer of the heart. So they returned, they went, they went inward, and they began the true, what St. Gregory Palamas would call the true activity of the church, which of the, of the soul, which is this, this inner prayer, going into still, the deep stillness of the heart. It says according to the commandment. It doesn't say which commandment. I mean, you would think, obviously, just reading it on the service, this would mean according to the commandment to keep the Sabbath holy. Well, but what is the Sabbath that you're supposed to keep holy? What if the Sabbath is the Sabbath rest or the death of God? So then how are you going to keep the death of God except by What's the best way to do it? Except by going into your own heart, which as I have I've suggested, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this as, as a dogmatic fact, I'm just, I'm just highly suspicious that the place of our death is not out there or over there, it's in here. So that when I go into my heart, I'm going into the place of my death. And there I keep stillness. Do you see how I mean, do you see how this is keeping the Sabbath? You got, what does it say? God say? That, you know, rest on the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath holy. Rest on the Sabbath. Well, you know, on a surface reading, that means 
you don't walk beyond a certain distance, right? So the synagogues have to be built within a certain uh, relationship to all the houses of the Jews, so they don't walk a certain distance. But this is a deeper sense of rest. <coughs> this is keeping the Sabbath holy in my heart by learning to practice the rest of stillness, the prayer of stillness deep in my heart where I am deep beyond all things. So what I'm seeing, what I'm suggesting to you is that um, that the women, and, and this is what we read on, on Thursday, the Thursday before we came into Great Mount, the women are already showing us the way. They're showing us what Great Lent is all about. And if we do what the scriptures tell us to do, in other words, I mean, if you, we do what the, and how can you know what the scriptures are doing if you don't know how to read it spiritually? But if this, is a, if this theological reading that I'm suggesting is, is fair, then the scripture is telling me this is how I enter Lent. This is what I'm doing during Lent. I'm returning into myself. So I'm, 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 I'm leaving, as it were, the visible church. I'm not actually leaving it. Rather, I am, I'm actually engaging the visible church. I mean, we engage the visible church during Great Lent quite rapidly. I mean, the service has increased exponentially. So you can come to the church several times during the week. So the visible aspect of the churches of the Lenten structure is, is quite active. But that visible aspect of the church's Lenten structure is opening onto it the church of the heart. So that as I engage the visible, I'm engaging the invisible of the heart. This, this business of engaging the heart, you know, this invisible part of me that is deep beyond all things. Um, as I, I, I've stressed this, that we cannot do this on our own. Um, and that's why we need the guidance of the church. So we just do what the church tells us to do. We do the visible things, the material things that the church tells us to do. And if we do those things mindfully, you know, if we do them in a sense of prayer, if we do them in a, in a, in a humble heart, or in, in, a, in a humble <coughs> heart, those visible things that the church is giving us to do will of themselves open our heart, open our soul onto our heart. In that light, we come upon the gospel for, I think it's the second Sunday of Lent, I think, and suddenly it, it makes sense to me. You know, it's, it's the gospel of the four men bringing the paralytic to Christ in the house, and the house is full, so they go up and they tear off the roof. It's as though what I see there is, this is what we're doing in Great Lent. We're trying to get to Christ in the house of our heart. So we have to tear off the roof. Well, how do we tear it off? Prayer, fasting, you know, coming to church, uh, almsgiving, in other words, showing kindness, showing mercy. These are the ways that we are, if we just do those things, mindfully, <coughs> perfectly, so forth and so on, we will find that we are taking off, we're tearing off, the roof of our heart, which corresponds, does it not, to the stone that covered the tomb of Christ and that was rolled away? I mean, all of these things, they just, you know, it's like they fit so nicely. I would have, a, I would, I'd be very disappointed if you were to tell me that, that that's not right. It just, it just, it makes so much sense. It's like a puzzle fitting together perfectly. So then you're not rolling it up like <clears throat> the Burberry women came there, but it was rolled away for them. So how do you relate that? You do, you do the disciplines of the church. And they will, and he will open. And the roof, and it's, those, it's through those disciplines. And remember, the disciplines of the church are the extension of Christ's cross. <laughs> when you pray, when you fast, when you practice giving alms, which again does not mean necessarily giving money. It means being nice and kind um, and generous uh, in, in soul as well as in material things. You are uh, you are taking up your cross, and you are um, you are engaging the power of the cross. What's the power of the cross that's in those disciplines? That is, you could say, is is, is tearing open, tearing off the roof. Synergia. Synergia. Yeah. 
you could also, I mean, I don't know how this might be pushing it too hard, but I mean, the myrrh-bearing women made their way to the tomb. That's what we're doing. To the discipline. We're making our way to the tomb. And all we have to do is just make our way to the tomb through prayer, through fasting. And the tomb will be open. The roof will be torn open. Um, just engage the visible church. Just engage it. Do it mindfully, humbly, with, with hunger, you know, with sincerity. And, and the power of the cross that is embedded, that is dripping in those in those disciplines will of itself start to open things up. And yeah, so the minute you try to force open the, your heart, you try to force it open, um, are you not in that moment coming down from the cross and now you are exercising your own ego? You see, you're, you're, you're trying to do things now according to your wisdom, according to your specs. Um, this is how I think it should be, so this is what I'll do. So this, so it, you know, it's the, the true activity, if you will, is inactivity. In a sense, the true activity is inactivity, and you have to be really active to train yourself to be inactive, <laughs> to get yourself still, so that your trust is in the Lord and not in your own ego and your own strength, your own wisdom. All right, so. That would, so then, this is what we read coming into Lent. So now in Lent, here we are. We're in the name. We're we're in the we're in the Church of the Heart uh, that is that is um, being engaged by the visible Church in the prayers of the Church, the services of the Church, the sacraments of the Church, yeah, the, the actual act of fasting, and so forth and so on. And now we're coming up upon the end of Lent. Coming upon the end of Lent. What's that all about? We're coming to the tomb of Lazarus. So you see that. But the, goal, see, the goal of Lent, the, the immediate goal of Lent is the tomb of Lazarus, which corresponds to my heart. Um, now, this makes me wonder if St. Paul, and when you read this outside the earth, I'm, reading, I'm now reading in Ephesians, according to the Ephesians. It's like when you read this outside of the Orthodox Church, um, you read it according to the letter, and you think that you've got it. You might, you know, you may be a biblical scholar, so you go into the history of it, you analyze it, you analyze its literary form, and based on your method, you come out with a certain uh, interpretation. But I have never seen this it's in, in St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians until I started reading it within this Lenten mis uh, structure of the church. I'm gonna, let me read it to you. And, and, and you tell me what, what you hear in the light of all of this. You see if you can't hear these three groups of threes in what St. Paul is saying. Now you, you were dead in your trespasses and in your sins. You walked in these, according to the age of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now active in the sons of disobedience, in whom also in whom you also conducted yourselves before, in the in the in the desires of the flesh, um, doing the will, doing what the doing the will of the flesh and the will of the mind. And we were children by nature of wrath, as also the rest. Um, but now God, who is so rich in mercy, through his great love in which he raised us, when we were dead in our sins, he made us alive in Christ. I'm going to stop there. And you see Lent and the tomb of Lazarus there. And you see it. I see. Okay, I take it that means that you don't particularly see it. Um, if we're coming, if we're, if we're, you know, in another place, St. Paul will say, put to death what's earthly in you. Well, where are we dead? In our heart. And the heart is called by St. Lucarius and St. Maximus and St. Isaac of Syria. 
the tomb. The tomb. So if we're trying to get into a heart, what are we trying to get into? You might say, into the tomb. We're trying to get into our tomb. So that's how this Lenten effort corresponds to the tomb of Lazarus. The tomb of Lazarus, of course, is the tomb of our heart. And that's where I'm trying to get to. By engaging the visible church. I'm trying to get into the tomb of my heart, that place where I'm dead. Now, what happens at the tomb of Lazarus? And can you see what it, what it is? What, what St. Paul is um, saying here? What happens at the tomb of Lazarus? Christ comes in. And does what? Right. And does what? He, does what? Raises he raises Lazarus. <coughs> Let me read it to you again. But God, being so rich in mercy, um, through the, his great love with which he loved us. Now what did Jesus do at the tomb before he raised Lazarus? Why did he do it? What? No. Confirm it. Yes. But God being rich in mercy through his great love with which he loved us. There's Christ weeping at the tomb of Lazarus. But then it says why? Because he loved him. So you understand, we are Lazarus. And the tomb of Lazarus is the tomb of Lazarus. So now what is happening? What's, what's been happening through this whole period of Great Lent? We have been going into our heart. It's like we have been we have been voluntarily putting to death all that's earthly in us so that we can die like Lazarus and be laid in the tomb of our heart. And then it says, and you, when you were dead in your trespasses, God made alive in Christ. So do you see that we end Great Lent with a resurrection? Christ is raising us as he raises Lazarus. Is that confusing? So then what's Holy Week all about? What, you know, what's all that about all about? Listen. By grace you are saved. In other words, by the grace of God, by the grace of the cross, you are saved. Um, and um, he, and he raises, and he raised up, and he raised you up, and he made you to sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Um, in order, uh, in order that, um, he, that he might demonstrate among the, among, among, in, in the ages, uh, the surpassing wealth of his grace that is about to come, and the kindness that is bestowed upon us in Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of your own, but it is the gift of God. I mean, understand, nobody can raise Lazarus except Jesus Christ. Nobody can make our heart alive except Jesus Christ. So that's why it's pointless, and that's why it's very important that we do not try, that we have to be aware, be wary of our own, of, of the tendency, of our egoistic tendency, you know, to, to try to do Lent as we think it should be done. You know, we have to be careful of that. Because I'm not the one who can raise my, we have to be careful against the tendency of the soul to delude to, of the ego to delude itself by wanting to believe that she that that she is saved by Christ and so it's not happened yet so the ego you know manufactures some sentimental emotion so that the ego can have this this, this souped up experience and believe that she has that he has it has been saved we have to guard against that so we have to put ourselves in our heart and we have to stay there in the tomb. Dude, Lazarus was in the tomb for four days. We have to stay in the tomb until Christ comes and raises us up. Now, let's see. Uh, and it goes on to say uh, that, that before you... Uh, because, all right. I'm going to have to read this again because I'm not. Uh, but uh, so I'm going to have to. We'll have to just kind of summarize the teaching of the church in this regard. So once you're raised from the tomb, which you, you see that corresponds to your baptism. 
So Lent is like it's like a descending into the tomb, into the font of our baptism. We're acting out our baptism in Lent. And when we come to the tomb of the Saturday, the Lazarus Saturday, it's like we have come to the bottom of the tomb, of the bottom of the font. And now in the joy of the resurrection of Lazarus, uh, we, we we experience in Christ calling to us. Myron, Emmanuel, Zonia, Mark, Daniel, come forth. We experience the joy of being raised in Christ. For what purpose? That we, may, that we may walk in the light as he is in the light. And where are we going as we walk in the light as he is in the light? And where are we walking in the light? If it's not here and now. You understand? You, you have been raised from the font. And through Lent, that, that mystery of the baptismal font has been repeated. Now you are raised up in Christ Jesus. And now you are, now we are making our way, um, we're making our way again, even as we did before Lent, but now it has, it's on a different key, it's at a different key. It's transposed to a higher key. Um, now when we make our way to Christ's tomb, what, where are we making our way to? I mean, what is the mystery of his death and resurrection now? It's given on, uh, in, the, in the readings that we do on, uh, for Great and Holy Saturday Matins, that we sing on Great and Holy Friday night. Dan is generally the one who says it. You read from Ezekiel, chapter 37. Remember what it says. He visits the dry bones. First. The vision of the dry bones. And it's, verse, uh, uh, and it's uh, chapter 37 of Ezekiel, <coughs> verse 12, is where, it, is where yeah, in, in the vision of the valley of the dry bones, he's raising Israel. What's that? Thirty-seven, verse twelve. Be thus saith the Lord: Behold, I will open your tombs, and I will bring you up out of your tombs, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. So, what's the land of Israel? What is that? What is that talking about here? In terms of Holy Week, when Christ is raised from the dead, He doesn't come back here. Right? He's in the garden. Which obviously is a symbol for Eden. But he's in a he's in a he's in a different state. I mean he's here, but he's not here. Because nobody recognizes him. Until he calls their name, which might be interesting. When he calls their name, suddenly Mary Magdalene recognizes him. But not before. There's something in that, you know, that, that name and the calling of the name. It goes back to doesn't go back to the garden. When Adam knew, he, he named the animals. God named Adam, named Adam. Adam named Eve. I mean, there's something very, you know, something deep going on here. A heart to heart that's going on here. He calls you by name, and you recognize him immediately. So the land of Israel here is the kingdom of heaven that has been opened by the resurrection of Christ. Yes. You know, on one on one level, it's 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 happening in space time. That's the visible part. The resurrection is happening in space time. That's the visible part. But that visible part of the resurrection of Christ opens onto the church of the heart. I would say, in, and you can see that when he calls Mary by name, Mary. He speaks to her heart. Now the heart is open, and she recognizes him. And but but he's not he he, he says don't touch me because I'm not you know I haven't ascended to my father yet this is this is not the destination you know so the land of Israel is the kingdom of his, is the kingdom of heaven that he's ascending to um, and you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves this takes us back to Lazarus your graves not my grave when I open your grave the the grave of Lazarus. Um, when I open your grave, that I may bring up my people from their graves. And I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live. And I will place you upon your own land, and you will know that I am the Lord. I have spoken, and I will do it, saith the Lord. That's what you read on Holy Friday night. Do you, do you see? So you see, you see the progression in. So from the visible church, which is the mystery of Christ's tomb in space-time, um, we move into the church of the heart, 
not losing the visible church, because it's through the visible church that we're able to engage the church of the heart. And as we engage the church of the heart, which is where, you know, the tomb, Christ raises us up um, so that we can go with him into his death and resurrection, which is the Passover, if you will, through the Jordan. You might say that our, that, I don't know, uh, uh, you know, this is like, I mean, it could perhaps that you could say that the raising of Lazarus corresponds to the Red Sea. Perhaps you could say the death and resurrection of Christ in, 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 in Holy Week now corresponds to the Jordan. So that we are now going with our Joshua, having been raised from the Red Sea, having been raised from the death, from the dead, and by his grace, having been clothed with his robe of glory, you know, have been woven into the very fabric of his death and life, so that we're, I mean, and he has been woven into the very fabric of our death and life, so that it's like we're, you know, we're, we're, we're wearing the same garment. <laughs> He's wearing our garment, we're wearing his garment all, all at once. So we're, and, and, and so he has illumined us, he has cleansed us. And as we, as we walk in the light, as we flee from the desires of the flesh, which lead to corruption and death, uh, we don't give ourselves to those anymore. So then as we do that, this whole life now becomes an exodus. This life, my life in this earth now becomes an exodus. I'm making my way through the wilderness, clothed in the garment of Christ. Christ himself as my leader. Christ as my Moses. I'm, and I'm walking through the wilderness in the power of his cross. And as we come into Holy Week, after, you know, after ha having experienced again the mystery of our baptism, um, we now follow Christ into the mystery of his death and resurrection. Uh, we're full of awe and wonder. We see the, the love that is now that with which he loved us. We see it acted out. I mean, in a way, I mean, you know, in a way that, that is, even as much as we can see it is incomprehensible, inexpressible. But, but we see it. And then we enter into, uh, through his death and resurrection on, on, on Friday, through the Holy Pasta, we're entering into the mystery, not just of his death and resurrection back here, but we're actually entering into the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. The, 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 the church of, of the kingdom. That's how I see it. Now, you can think about it. Um, you recall the name is actually kind of ties it together for me with like back to the mountain part because you were saying like God comes down from the top of the mountain to meet us at that Three hundred dollars for the needle. When we get communion, you say our yes. name, you yes. know. So it's like God calling to us, but we can't hear or see Him until we've done the sure. cleansing process. And so it kind of makes sense. If you try to do it yourself, you can't roll that stone away yourself. You can't yeah. see Him yourself unless you do the work of yeah. Him. And then He, then yes. we'll see Him when He calls you. And he calls all of us, but we just can't hear Him. Yeah. So we have to be obedient. Just be obedient. What you just said reminds me also. Remember that after Adam and Eve fall. I would dissipate. Well, remember what God says. He comes and what does he say? Where are you? Adam, where are you? It's not only that we can't see him, it's as though he can't see us anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember what I was reading now. It's several years ago, but it's, it gives it gives uh, a background even to the cross. Why does he ascend the cross? I think I might, I might have picked it up from one of the liturgical texts. He ascends the cross because he's looking He's going to go into the death, into hell. He's going to shine his light in hell to find us. So this thing is so. So there you go. Something to think about as we now go as we begin as we make the last lap to the tomb of Lazarus. The tomb of you know the tomb of the, the raising of Lazarus isn't just wasn't just picked up because oh that'd be a nice thing to end Lent with. <laughs> There's something going on here. Yeah, something missed about something very powerful.